Defense News is proudly sponsored by Navy Federal Credit Union. If you're a member of our nation's armed forces, the Department of Defense, or if your family is, we'd be proud to serve you too. We have a very special episode of Defense News Weekly today, focused on the service members we've lost. First, we hear the story of a family who found a very special item years after the death of their soldier. We also visit the National Museum of the United States Army to see ways the museum is honoring soldiers killed in action. Finally, we remember service members who have died while serving our country this past year. That and the latest news is coming up on Defense News Weekly. Welcome back to Defense News Weekly, I'm Andrea Scott. When Maggie Bainbridge's husband died in 2015, she faced a problem known to many who've lost a loved one. She would never receive another memento from her husband. No more gifts, no more surprises. Everything he had left behind was already in her hands. But then on a trip to the dry cleaners earlier this year, she got an unexpected surprise, seven years after her husband's death. She told us about what happened earlier this week. When he was first diagnosed with cancer and he had his, he had had the Nissen on his esophagus and then he had had his bladder removed and his prostate removed and his kidney removed and he ended up being hospitalized. And the corpsman, when he was, I was check, they were checking him into the hospital, he was looking at his medical record and he looks at him and I'm just sitting there and he goes, sir, you're a tough some bitch. And so that's whenever I get nervous, Bill would always be like, remember, I'm a tough son of a bitch. And so then the kids heard that, and then they were pretty sure that Bill was Superman. Like Elizabeth, when she was little, used to say, my dad is Superman. Like she believed that. And so whenever he would get chemo, and that was our family time, we would go to infusions over the weekend, he would wear a Superman shirt. And so we called him Superman. He was our Superman. So I think that best describes him. I was married to Superman. His family, he was the first to graduate from college and it was able to give him an opportunity. His mother was a factory worker um, and so there were not a lot of opportunities, there wasn't a lot of money. And so I say the military kind of raised him and um, he loved being part of the military. He served for 23 years, so it was kind of all he knew. I noticed him, I, I just thought he was very handsome and he had a high and tight and he was sunburned. And I didn't know that he was just coming back from Kuwait. And so we just started talking and we get on the plane and it's this humongous plane and we're sitting next to each other. And so we talked the entire time and then we handed each other our landlines because we didn't have cell phones. Again, it was a long time ago. And the next day he calls me, he's like, oh, I was trying to be cool, but you know, I really wanted to talk with you. And our first date was at the TGI Fridays. I got a Caesar salad and he got something else and he wanted to pay for it and I said, let's go Dutch. And I gave him a check and he never cashed it. He always kept it in his wallet. And then a year later we were engaged and a year after that we were married. So he had had, he, he was diagnosed with a Nissen when we were, after he came back from Kuwait and we, when we were in Kansas and that's where he had his surgery there. It never occurred to us that that's what caused it. We just thought, you know, he got it, you know, and they tested to make sure it wasn't genetic. And they said because of the grade and that Bill was not a smoker, and that it happened within less than five years, and they were able to identify what they think caused it. All of his doctors across the board stated that's what it was from, is from toxic exposure. When he was in the, they think from when he was in the Persian Gulf, he ended up getting Barrett's esophagus, um, and so he had to have a Nissen on his, it's a surgery on his esophagus. And then when he came back from Iraq, they think the bladder cancer, they're not sure about the prostate, but they're sure the bladder cancer was from toxic exposure when he was deployed in Iraq. So it was two different exposures. He called me and he said, oh, they think it's okay. I just have a urinary tract infection, but there's a shift change and, um, sorry. 
and the new doctor wants to see me. And so the new doctor came on and he said, let's just do a CAT scan and an MRI and see, you know, I, I don't think this is urinary tract infection. And they looked and they found a mass in his kidney. And they're like, oh, we found that he has prostate cancer also. But we removed it soon enough. So 96% of the time he'll be okay. And then a few months later, he started coughing up blood. At the end of September 2015, early October 2015, he was hospitalized. And then um, they did an echocardiogram at the end of October and they said, you have about it. You have hours to live. And he died about 36 hours after that. <laughs> he said, he said, um, he said, I, I beat cancer because the cancer is going to die with me. I fought it all this time and now I'm going to beat it. Sorry. He said, I finally beat it because it's going to die with me. And then his last words as I held him was home. He kept saying home and I said, oh baby, just go home. It's okay. So a few months ago, I decided I was going to have a month of yes. I've been saying no to everything. People ask me to do something, I'm like, no, no. So I decide, I'm going to say yes to everything. If someone asks me something, I'm going to say yes to it. And so one of the things was that we volunteered or we decided we would go to this honor guard gala, the kids and I, because this was my month of yes. I was like, I don't want to buy a new dress. So I ended up wearing a very old dress that was dry clean. And my son wore a suit, which he normally doesn't. And I didn't know where to take them. I was like, there's a lot of places, like where should I go? And the kids were like, well, go where daddy went, which is just a right, right around the corner of where we live. So I go to the dry cleaner and I hand her my ticket and she's, pulling these clothes that I don't recognize and she's dusting them. And I'm like, that's really odd. Like, why is she dusting clothes? And then she pulls out more clothes, dusting some more. And I'm like, I don't see my dress and suit. And then she holds the dress and suit and she brings them all forward. And I'm thinking, what is this? And then I look and it's dry cleaning that my husband had dropped off. So these are the shirts that I got back. And if you can look at the date, you can see that um, it was September 29th, 2015 and he was in the hospital by then. And then a month later in a day, he was dead. And so it was extraordinary. When someone dies, what people don't realize is you don't get any more pictures. You don't have any more items of theirs. You don't, that's it. The last picture you have is the last picture you have of them. And so I had come to terms with that until a few weeks ago, I ended up going to the dry cleaner and I ended up getting nine more shirts of my husband. And that's extraordinary. That's something that just doesn't happen. I would, so when I got them, I was over the moon. I couldn't believe it. I was actually speechless. I was just, you can't, but I assume this is what it's like doing drugs. Like this. <laughs> but it was actually, I don't know how to put that. But I, it was, okay, I have a better, I, it was like winning the lottery. It was actually better than winning the lottery. The chances of being able to get more items of my husband, I would have a better chance of winning the lottery than getting more items of my husband. So it felt like I won the lottery. It was, I was over the moon. He was quiet when you first met him, but he was very also social. And he was one of those people that everyone appeared to like him. And like, he really did. He had this, this personality. I'm an introvert and he was an extrovert. And so it worked out really well together. Um, yeah, he was a pretty amazing guy. Thanks to the Tragedy Assistance Program for Survivors for putting us in touch with Maggie. After the break, we go inside the National Museum of the United States Army to see some extraordinary stories of soldiers who died in battle. It's important for Americans to think about the sacrifices that our U.S. troops make every day. But on Memorial Day in particular, we set aside time to think about the troops who've given the ultimate sacrifice and were killed in combat. We're here at the National Museum of the United States Army in Fort Belvoir, Virginia, where we hear some stories about soldiers who gave everything. So behind me are 41 stainless steel pylons that tell different stories of soldiers who served 
over time. And the story I want to talk about belongs to First Lieutenant Ashley White Stump, a National Guard soldier from North Carolina. And she volunteered to be part of a cultural support team in Afghanistan. And as a female, that gave her greater access to Afghan women and children um, to support her mission. Unfortunately, during uh, operation in Kandahar, Afghanistan, she was killed as part of an IED explosion. But her service and her sacrifice and her commitment um, sort of paved the way for other female soldiers to participate uh, during uh, battle and war in, in Afghanistan. So it, we, we remember her story and her sacrifice through this pylon. Um, so visitors who come can, can engage and personalize with her story um, and, and come away with a, a deeper appreciation for not only what she did, but other women have served uh, in the Army. So on October 9th, 1993, uh, Super 6-1, which is the call sign for the Black Hawk helicopter that went down uh, during the Battle of Mogadishu. This was the first helicopter to be shot down by a rocket-propelled grenade, turning sort of this raid to capture a key warlord uh, into sort of a grueling two-day battle. So you can see the, the metal, the twisted metal, and the rust sort of represents kind of you know what soldiers went through, not only during that crash, but throughout the whole battle. This is the co-pilot's engine uh, up for the Black Hawk. Um, so in the initial crash site, um, it obviously it was there for, for multiple years, and it took a while, A, to locate where the, the engine and pieces of the helicopter were, and then to figure out how to, way to repatriate it back into the United States. Um, so, you know, it, it's important um, to acquire these pieces to help tell that story. Um, and so you can see, you know, the result of the crash, what it you know, did to the engine and what it did to the airframe and to the, everything that's on that Black Hawk. Just to give you an idea of what those soldiers went through on that initial crash. So, Getting this piece back, repatriating it back to the United States to be put on display here uh, allows visitors to get you know, uh, closer to the story, to understand what they went through uh, and what that battle was about, but also more importantly, the sort of the service and the sacrifice those soldiers uh, made during that battle. So the rifle behind me belonged to Private Martin Tehan. He was a soldier with the 508th Parachute Infantry Regiment who jumped on D-Day into Normandy, France. He survived the landing, but shortly thereafter was killed. But what's unique about this artifact is that it was discovered 72 years later by a French farmer who then uh, notified a French officer who got in contact with the United States Army. So in 2016, this rifle was given back to the Army, uh, taken under the care of then Chief of Staff of the Army, General Mark Milley, who actually had this rifle on display inside his office until it was donated to the museum to be put on display here. And what's really unique is, you, is his name, M.T. Han, is etched into the butt of the rifle. So you have this strong connection to the soldier with the rifle, but then this powerful story of how this artifact survived and able to be put in the museum so Tehan's story could become known. So on display we have PFC Weldon Miles Purple Heart. Uh, he was killed in combat um, on Hill 724 uh, as part of the Battle of Docto on November 11th, 1967. There was gruesome fighting on that hill um, where Americans engaged the enemy. Um, and he was young, 19 years old. Having this Purple Heart uh, on display uh, is a testament to the sacrifice of not only PFC Miles, but all soldiers who served in the United States Army. 
So as we, as we you know, honor those soldiers uh, on Memorial Day, um, we, we, we have to listen, look, and find out his stories by coming to this museum, hearing those stories, seeing the artifacts that are directly related to those soldiers is very, very important. The National Museum of the United States Army is open on Memorial Day for the first time this year. If you'd like to visit, the museum will be offering a moment of silence at 10 a.m. There's also plenty more to see and learn about the Army here at the museum. Thanks to the National Museum of the U.S. Army for letting us drop by. And now for Defense Dollars. Columbia has selected Nexter's Caesar Howitzer as part of an effort to modernize its Army field artillery capabilities. That deal is worth some $35 million, according to a military source in Bogota, who remains anonymous due to security reasons. The French made six-wheel drive 155mm howitzer was shortlisted in late 2021, with the Army selecting it earlier this May followed by the government accepting the decision and authorizing the start of negotiations. When we return, we get the latest tips from our financial expert in this week's Money Minute. Welcome back. On this edition of Money Minute, Navy Federal Credit Union personal finance expert Jeanette Mack walks you through different ways to open a checking account. A checking account is a fundamental part of your personal finances. If you're on a mission to open one, you've got lots of options. And it's easy. Just let your fingers do the shopping. Online, that is. You can open a checking account at most any bank or credit union's website, and it's usually super fast. Combined with a debit card and mobile deposits, you may never have to go into a branch to manage your checking account. You can do it all online or through an app. You can likely do the same with your savings account, too. You can even have them connected so when you get paid, you can set up an auto deposit to your savings account. Just make sure you've got the funds to open your account and see if it will require a minimum monthly balance. You don't want to rack up unnecessary fees. To avoid that, open a fee-free checking account and make sure you're monitoring your account frequently to manage your spending and a healthy budget. Some accounts may even offer interest on your balances or ATM rebates or both. Shop around or talk to your financial institution and in no time, you'll have a checking account that meets all your needs. Thanks, Jeanette. We'll see you next time. For more around-the-clock coverage of military and defense stories, head on over to Army, Navy, Air Force, and MarineCorpsTimes.com and DefenseNews.com for the latest updates. And to get a curated list of top stories in your inbox every weekday, subscribe to our Early Bird Brief and make sure to follow us on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and YouTube. When we return, my report on a recent ceremony sending off a very special Marine. And later, we remember those who died in the past year as part of our Memorial Day coverage. We're here at the Marine Corps Barracks in Washington, D.C. for the retirement ceremony and pardoning of a very special Marine. Chesty the 15th is the Marine Corps mascot who participates in the Friday evening sunset parades here at the barracks. But he's been a bad boy this year, and today he was pardoned by the Secretary of the Navy. We also got to see the change of command ceremony for the new mascot, Chesty the 16th. We thank you, Lord, for the service of Jesse the 15th and his embodiment of the devil dog spirit and bid him farewell. Uh, today, Lance Corporal Chesty the 15th was relieved of his duties from the, Marine, or the barracks mascot and Chesty the 16th was appointed for his duty today. Uh, I worked with Chesty the 15th for two years. Um, I've known him since he was a puppy, actually, so I used to watch him in my office. and. Um, I trained with him and I trained the other Marines to do the sequence and then now I'm doing the same with 16. Talking to the dog this morning, uh, he didn't, you can tell he didn't seem to eat that much because he was looking for all the treats, but I did ask him what, uh, what he had for breakfast of his last day, uh, official day in the Marine Corps, and he said pooch eggs. <laughs> <laughs> 
Chesty the 15th is quite the character. Uh, there was one phase two where we were walking out from where we stage for the crescent, which is at the end. We'll form in a crescent shape and we'll take pictures with guests. We take pictures with the guest of honor and do all that good stuff. And we were walking out and he, there's steps. He like flew to try to bite somebody's scabbard and fell. And it was just probably my favorite memory of him. <laughs> so before today, he has jumped on other guests. Um, it's his way of showing love, I think. And uh, we were at like a Toys for Tots event and there was lots of food and some kid had like a chicken stick on his, in his hand. And then Chesty just attacked him. Not attacked him, but jumped for the chicken. It was World War II, the Germans called the Marines the Devil Dogs, and that was our nickname from there, and we chose a bulldog because they are very scary looking. Their reactions are great. They're like, oh my gosh, we love dogs. Uh, we have cat people that'll come, and they love the dog. Um, a few things that Chesty did get on the naughty list are, um, he stopped like prior to the stopping point, He's a, like attacked scabbards um, mid crescent. Rumor has it that he like pooped on the parade deck. Um, he's done that during practice, but he tries to run in the grass. He'll roll around. He's rolled around in the grass during crescent and meeting guests. So he's a naughty boy. The Chesty the Fifteen has been a good friend to many, many, many an individual here in Washington D.C. in many ways. And as far as these, you know, accusations that have been made, you know, I'm a big believer that you've got to have evidence as well. Uh, a lot of these perhaps are just that, allegations not supported by evidence themselves. Perhaps in some ways, you know, this is a tough town, Chesty. There's a lot of other dogs around here who might be spreading rumors about you, you know, hoping to become the head dog in the Marine Corps, perhaps. And that's the way sometimes this, uh, this city works. Nevertheless, hearing that, I am prepared to issue my verdict. Under the power vested in me as Secretary of the Navy on behalf of the President of the United States, I hereby pardon Chester the 15th of all your offenses. Today hearing Chester's uh, pardoning from the Secretary of the Navy, it was super heartwarming. Um, I'm going to miss him. We've got a very special relationship. While Chesty the 15th will be enjoying retirement, you can visit the Marine Barracks Washington this summer to see Chesty the 16th in action. Since last Memorial Day, 19 U.S. service members have died in support of named operations around the world. Here are their names and faces.
And that's all we have time for this week. Please visit us on militarytimes.com and defensenews.com for more coverage. Thanks for joining us, and we'll see you next week.